Uh, Todd, again, thank you so much for being with us um, for the Scripture Ministry Lecture, for your lecture yesterday, and uh, your general ministry to the ter church and calling uh, our attention to a, uh, the reality of death and the hope of uh, the resurrection. Uh, in your talk yesterday, throughout many occasions, um, you talked about a superficial res resurrection hope, and I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and Taylor, I th you're uh, especially interesting in this conversation. I know your own area of research is in theological aesthetics, and you've looked quite a bit of, at uh, the, the genre of death in the arts and, um, and their attempt to grapple with, a, with the genuineness, the rawness, the, re the reality of death. Um, so, to get the conversation going, if, Todd, if you would just say a little bit more about what this superficial resurrection hope is that's in our church, uh, why it's problematic, uh, and hopefully we can move our way in the conversation to what a genuine resurrection hope um, entails and how it gives us a different way of approaching death. Yeah. Well, there's a number of ways in which I think we can um, really in some ways mute our witness to resurrection hope, even if we're talking um, about the resurrection. One common way is um, just to conform to all the cultural forces in the modern West of um, denying the real reality and potency of death. Um, there's a number of ways in which this um, happens. Um, for example, as a cancer patient, I often see, you know, billboards and magazine advertisements um, which say, you know, um, be a hero, um, you know, fight against cancer to the very end, you know, cancers, you know, win that fight against cancer. And I've, um, you know, seen people through the whole process of dying where um, this is the accolade that they want. Um, and they've been formed by a culture um, to want that they were the ones who sort of fought um, cancer to the very end, um, more so than that they were the faithful husband or the father or, or those. And I'm not saying that they weren't faithful in these ways, but um, the idea of actually preparing for death and at some point admitting that medicine has limits and that our body has limits has become almost a heresy. Um, and this is borne out through some sociological research as well, um, particularly on cancer patients. And yesterday I referred to um, a study from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute where those with high religious commitment were over four times as likely to ask for sort of um, extreme measures mm. at the end of life, um, then those were less religious. And I mean, it's not a surprise to doctors at all that those who asked for extreme measures didn't live any longer than those who did not. Um, but it, it did take them away from their families. It did take them away from their faith communities in those final weeks and days. Mm. And, um, but I think that as Christians, we've assumed that a resurrection hope um, either means, sometimes it means healing now, sometimes it means um, prolonging life as, as long as possible, and sometimes it means that we just don't talk about death. So even funerals, at Christian funerals, it's become more and more common not even to use the word death, um, not to have a body in a coffin, you know, present. Um, and to turn it into kind of a hero-making ceremony with, you know, a lot of slides and pictures and inspiring mm -hmm. music. And, you know, we don't want to talk about death as if there's no loss um, taking place here. And that is just um, so far from the biblical witness where some of the whole context for the resurrection hope is that um, the Old Testament in particular is so utterly honest that... Um, death has something irreversible about it. It silences, in some sense, our loved ones. It takes them away from us. Mm -hmm. This is a profound loss. And it's such a loss, death is such a problem that not even a healing or a resuscitation can fix it. All healings are just temporary. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing about resurrection is that it's about God and God's covenant hope 
for his people so that resurrection actually does deal with the problem of death. It's not just living, you know, extending um, a life, but that God will provide the life to participate in the resurrection of Christ um, with bodies that will not decay and, and um, have um, corruption. So it's, it's a radical message and profoundly good news. Um, but I think that we actually downplay it and we miss the power of the resurrection when we think sometimes, ah, oh, you know, death, it's either not that big of a deal, you know, because they're in a better place and, and not recognizing the loss that happens. Um, um, or w when we, um, yeah, don't refuse to prepare for um, death and refuse to recognize it um, when, you know, a, a doctor, whoever says, look, you have a limited body. Our medicine is limited. There are limits here. And, and some Christians feel compelled by their Christian faith to say, no, that is not right. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that. And um, it's a difficult balance because there is a place for, you know, praying for um, um, God to do amazing and surprising things. Um, but sometimes we can use that as an excuse to deny our mortality. And, you know, scripture says that our lives are like a breath before the everlasting God. And, and sometimes I think we're in denial about that. There's so many things I'd, I want to respond to there. Um, a couple thoughts, just briefly. You know, I'm realizing just in our conversation that our prayers for healing um, not only are short-sighted about how God might use that difficulty or that struggle or that suffering, but also um, really miscalculate, you know, what the good life is and, and don't take into account that the life to come is a richer, fuller, more profound communion with God. Um, mm -hmm. And that and it's almost as if we, if we could recognize that all prayers for healings, will, the, the Lord will never answer with no. He can only answer with not yet and that we might just sort of open our hands and be more patient about mm -hmm. it to, mm -hmm. to see what he might do in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I, think that, I think this is one of the areas where the church is really losing her witness uh, in the way that she's watered down the gospel on this, on this point about the resurrection uh, in, in kind of having these celebrations of life services rather than a funeral and and you know the practice of sitting up with the dead or wakes or these sorts of things are going by the wayside. I mean, I've even heard stories of of you know people who've you know they've you know there's a funeral and the funeral director can't get the grown children of the deceased to come back for the funeral. I mean, they'll mm -hmm. you know pay for the funeral with a credit card over the phone or something, but can't be bothered to make the trip back. And you mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. and and if it is an empty ritual, you know, there's a sense in which, um, I mean, as horrible as it sounds, it's hard to blame them as much. But I th what I think is fascinating is as we look at our modern world, um, that grief is, is going to get out. You know, that, those, those expressions of mourning are going to find their way out. And, and I think, you know, we see, you know, the roadside memorials, for instance, you know, where, where flowers or, or garlands are laid. And, a place of an accident or the way that, you know, rear windows of cars have decals with, you know, like much like a tombstone would read or websites are created for the deceased or, I mean, even, you know, a tattoo or something of the deceased and their birth and death date. You know, these, ex these expressions of grief are going to get out. The question is, will the church have a role in, in, in that process or in that, mo will the church be able to speak into that moment with the word of the gospel? Um, and I think it really hinges on the, on the fact that, as you point out in, in the book, there's a way in which Christians can place their hope in hope itself mm 
and that hope in Christ. And, and one is very pretty and nice and, and neat and um, not so messy, but hope in Christ, hope in a crucified, resurrected Savior whom, who himself experienced um, you know, the most profound forms of suffering. I mean, we re as biblical historians point out, the crucifixion is a, is a horrible and excruciating way to die, but there are worse forms of death. So just the physical suffering that he's experiencing in the moment is not the sum total of what's happening. You know, there's a profound inner death that's happening to him as well, and he's fully present to that moment, and that's what makes his quotation of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So po potent and poignant for us that he's in that moment aware of all the meaninglessness of death and he's facing it. Um, hope in Christ, I think, is a hope that's open to, with Christ tasting a bit of that bitter drink, of that having a, 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 even a small experience of that profound meaninglessness that he's, that he's experiencing. That, that, I think, is what Paul's talking about in, in Philippians, when he's about fellowshipping, you know, fellowshipping in his sufferings. And I don't know if we have the stomach for it. I don't know if the church has the stomach for it anymore. Um, but the reality is those expressions of grief are going to, are going, you, you know, we will never fully celebrate anyone's life unless we've fully lamented the loss, unless we've fully allowed ourselves to grieve and mourn the loss. That celebration is incomplete. It's a band-aid on a gaping wound, and, you know. I think creating that space for lament and not and not having, you know, a Christian funeral be this kind of limp admixture of of mourning and celebration. You know, trying to trying to do thing do two things and do neither well. You know, when we've acknowledged that you know because of the gospel we have great. We have, we have confidence, we have grounds to actually say how unnatural and out of sync this loss is. You know, this is not how, it, as you said, this is not how it should be. I think the gospel gives us the grounds to do that. Do we have the courage to press into the realities of the gospel? That, I think, is a question the church is, needs to face today in a new way. So I'm, I'm thankful for your book. That, that pushes us closer to the, facing those tough questions. Would, would you guys say uh, that a genuine resurrection hope and a genuine lament, let's say, in the face of death, are necessarily tied together? So a superficial um, encounter with death corresponds with probably not just a superficial resurrection hope, but a superficial uh, or a shallow um, approach to life. So that in a sense, and, and it's not to say that we have to go to one first, but a genuine resurrection hope is going to emerge as we encounter the, the genuine lament of the brokenness of the world. You, they come together. And on, on the inside, superficially, we lose them both. Would, would you say that's an uh, accurate statement? Or do you think there's not something quite right about it? Well, I think they go together um, because our story is the story of Christ's dying and rising. And so um, there's, as Paul says in Colossians 3, right now our lives are hidden with Christ in God. That means that we actually don't have to make sense of everything mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, when we have a death and there isn't just a visible success. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like this is a perfect closure to the story, whether it's 
a, a child or a young person or an older person, there's still something about death that just encroaches. Mm. And I think we can be honest about that because right now our true life, which is Jesus Christ, is hidden. Mm. It's, um, we, have, we have died and our true life is, is in Christ. Um, but um, when Christ is revealed and when, his, when he comes again to establish his final kingdom, um, that will be the final chapter of the story. I mean, our temptation is we want to write the final chapter of um, our loved one's um, story, but it's Christ who gets to do that. We don't have to make sense of it. We don't have to say, oh, you know, this tragic car accident, somehow this was part of what God was up to and this must be the reason. That's not our job. We should stay away from that. That's, that's Job's friends, right? Um, Job's friends start out well when they just um, sit with Job um, and then they go badly when they try to speculate about God's reasons. Um, I'm not saying that God doesn't have reasons, but I am saying that we don't have access to them and, and we don't. And, and, and the freeing thing is we don't have to try to come up with them because um, the Christian life is not about just one visible success upon another. Um, we are about spreading the word of the kingdom of God, which is a tiny mustard seed, can't even be seen. And, and, and then seeing how God works in the midst of it. So I really feel that the central storyline of a funeral needs to be the storyline of Jesus Christ, um, um, which has both um, hope <laughs> and this absolutely, you know, absolute confrontation with death and alienation um, um, as, as he has um, taken this on in his own person.